Hi, I'm Mark Madison, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action that we do out here at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Today we're particularly fortunate to have an expert on bird songs uh, with us. So, so let me briefly introduce our, our guest this afternoon. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Don Krudsma with us. Uh, Don is a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He's a fellow at the Cornell Ornithological Lab, is, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, today he's going to talk about really the culmination of over 30 years of work he's done on bird songs uh, that really resulted in this, this beautiful book uh, called The Singing Life of Birds, uh, The Art and Science of Listening to Bird Songs. It's a wonderful book. Uh, and, and best of all, it's, it's the only book I own that came with a CD of bird songs attached. There's about great sound. Just under a hundred tracks of, of yes. uh, bird songs and an amazing teaching tool. And just, I've been put in the car <laughs> to it, so I really enjoyed it. So Don, welcome. It's a Thank pleasure you. to have you. An enormous pleasure to be here. And, and before I start peppering you with questions, I'd just like to remind folks uh, that this is a live interactive broadcast. And uh, throughout the broadcast, we'll run a phone number. Uh, and if you have any questions, please do call in. Don will be happy to answer any questions you might have. We could talk about, about birds them. and their songs. <laughs> 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 well, let me begin with an obvious question. How did you become interested in bird songs? Oh, some of the best things in life happen by accident, I think. And, and there were several requirements that I had to do to graduate from college and then to work off a fellowship during a summer. And, mm -hmm. And Sewell Pettingill at the University of Michigan Field Station actually said, all right, we gave you a $100 fellowship. you got to work this off. Now, <laughs> now go record some bird songs. And wow, I think there's a magic that once, once you put those headphones on your ears and you aim a big microphone like I have here at a singing bird, it's like you're reach out, reaching out and grabbing that song right off the bill of the bird. And, and I fell into this black hole of bird song 35 uh, plus years ago. Wow. And, I have never escaped, thankfully. <laughs> Great. Well, you brought some of your tools of the trade here. Why don't, why don't you tell us what some of these okay. devices are? Well, the most important thing is to grab that song from the bird. And, and this parabolic microphone does just that. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little higher tech version of what we do when we cup our hands to our ears. Mm -hmm. We really are amplifying physically the sound. So. From way back in high school geometry, we learned that a parabola was really a precision instrument, and all the sound that strikes this parabola is reflected back to the microphone here at the focal point. And so there are actually two microphones here. There's a left and a right, so when you record, you feel this stereo effect. You're focusing not only on that bird right at the focal point, but you hear the left and the right. And then you always, oh, you need good headphones. You've got to listen uh, to what you're recording. And you need your lucky recording cap, too, to get the good stuff. <laughs> the most important. Most important. And, there. and tape recorders. What an evolution tape recorders have taken. They used to be these big reel-to-reel -reel things. And, and I've just whooshed through a whole sequence of recorders. And I record directly to a hard drive on a computer now in, in WAV file format. And, Oh, that's uh, the a lot technology. And carrying oh. all the reel to reels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 25 pounds of tape recorder, now uh, one or two. Well, uh, we can talk a little about what's in the book, but, but now that you've shown us the equipment for recording the bird songs, I thought it might be fun to, to listen to a bird song and, and maybe show folks a sonogram. Is that yeah, the correct term sonogram. For, the, for the form? So why don't we uh, go to the woodpecker okay. um, and, and see if we can look at a sonogram. And then uh, maybe you can interpret for us uh, what we're hearing on this yes. woodpecker drumming. That would be slide two. If we could cue up slide two. There it is. And, when, and Mark, when people say sonogram, some people start to shake because it's, it's a technical term. <laughs> yeah. But when I look at this, I say, that's a musical score for birdsong. And people lighten up a little. And, and it really is a musical score because you read it from left to right, just like you would our musical scores. And frequency or pitch is on the vertical. So that first one there that says downy woodpecker, you see those, oh, I don't know how many times that woodpecker is striking the tree, but it's a noisy sound, a gunshot, a door slamming, a woodpecker slamming its bill into a tree, gives you a broad frequency span. So each one of those times a bird strikes, its, strikes a tree with its bill, you see one of those vertical imprints. And you look over at the right at that uh, hairy woodpecker, Instantly, you can see that the hairy is drumming far more rapidly. And people who know how to distinguish downy from hairy 
you know, hear this, and, but once you see it, I think it really drives, we're really yeah. visual animals. It really drives into us uh, memorizing. And then my favorite, down at the bottom, that yellow-bellied sapsucker, the sapsucker has a real rhythm to it. And what you see, though, is very informative because you don't actually hear those soft little echoes. Initially, you'll see three bold strikes, and then there's another bold strike with a little bit of an echo trailing that. Our ears are such that we won't actually hear that. So we're going to hear, when we play this, we'll hear those three initial ones, and then they're more spaced out, and that, that distinctive little trailing off at the end. So we'll just play all three in sequence, and I think you get a good feeling for what they look and sound like. Go ahead and click on that little speaker and uh, we should get the sounds. I'll have a hunch the audience is hearing it, but we're not. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe neither. We seem to be enduring a silent spring here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this happens sometimes. We have these technical Well, matters. we figure out the technical difficulties. Let me ask you something that, that came up on that slide. That, that's called woodpecker drumming. Yes. Um, there's a lot of different terms we use for the, the noises right. birds make. Yes. Calls, drums, yes. uh, songs. How, how do you distinguish between them? Is, is there a technical definition for these oh. various utterances? Or? I think we're very sloppy. We humans need to have categories. So <laughs> we say that all these sounds fall into two categories. Why there's singing and then there are the calls. But then what do you do with the drumming? You know, all right, well, let's call that singing too because <laughs> it's kind of a mechanical singing. Uh, so the terminology is quite sloppy and it, because some birds really don't sing. Like a cedar waxwing, we don't think of them as singing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have all these songbirds, cedar waxwing and crows and jays, they're songbirds, but we don't think of them as having songs. And then there are other birds like flycatchers that aren't true songbirds, but they sing too. So, so it's, yeah, it's, it's confusing. It's confusing. It's very confusing. <laughs> like everything else. <laughs> Uh, now they've pulled up another slide. Mm -hmm. uh, hear that now this time. Okay. Uh, we did broadcast last time too. Excellent. So they heard, the audience heard that. Great. So, yeah, here's another. Uh, uh, this is the second uh, uh, series of sonograms that I show people to try to tell them how to see and hear at the same time. And once you've done that, I think you're, you're really far more of an expert than you think. So when you look at this, a lot of people know the white-throated sparrow, and mm -hmm. it's nice, beautiful, pure whistles. And you look at this and you see two high ones and then a bunch of low ones. And it ends in those nice little triplets, and you see and hear it. And with a yellow throat, a common warbler, the field guides will say it sings wichity, 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 wichity. Well, you can see those four syllables. But now the birds, the, this yellow throat song starts to happen so quickly that our ears can't appreciate it. And I, birds can hear so much better than we can. So we start to slow songs down. And I think when we slow that yellow throat song down about four times, we are starting to hear it much like they hear it. Ah. So we can play these two. And what we will actually hear is the white throated. Now the yellow throat at half speed, and then quarter and see each detail. And once you've seen the woodpeckers and these two songbirds, you're an expert. That's all you need to know. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, what caused you or others to... to to decide to slow down the song. That actually never occurred to me to, to, to get more detail out of it. How did that come about? Well, I th for years it was said that birds can hear about 10 times better in time than we can. So the logical conclusion is that, well, let's slow this song down 10 times and then maybe we're hearing it like the birds actually hear it. And exactly the, whether it's one tenth or one quarter or what it is, or whether birds have a, an additional ability to hear that we can't, 
there's something in there that when we slow it down, we start to feel these details that the birds certainly can hear. That's fa Which bird sings the fastest that, that you've encountered? Oh, the fastest. Or what uh, is one of the fastest? Because it, it does come up in your book. Some of the birds sing so fast oh, they it's, do. it's bewildering. Well, Roger Tory Peterson in his field guide says the hens of sparrows has the most, most pathetic song among <laughs> songbirds. But when you slow it down, there's just this rich crescendo of song. So, so it, it's, again, our ears that are failing us. But, oh, these winter wren, a western winter wren, it just blitzes through its song. But then you realize when you look at the songs of neighboring winter wrens, they're almost identical, so they can hear the precise details that are just a blur to us. They can hear them because they have to imitate them from each other. So their ears are just tuned into this, whereas we need some technical aid. Now you said they're almost the same, um, but they're not identical to them, are they? Or? The, the two neighboring birds, yeah, there yeah. might be some slight differences, uh, but you look at the individual notes and really they're indistinguishable. But, but these birds have, uh, I think if they wanted to have precisely the same songs, wanted, so to speak, they could. <laughs> uh -huh. But I think that built into a lot of this is some, in, I use the word intentional loosely, but some slop or some, some differences that are actually useful then in distinguishing individuals from each other. Karaoke. So, <laughs> yeah. So the, they are so good at what they do that I'm convinced if, if there were a need for having precise songs, they'd do it. But I think there's a need for having a little bit imprecise songs. It's very interesting. Well, since you mentioned wrens, let's go to the marsh wren. That's, that's another bird. Oh, well, let's do the song sparrow first. Excuse right. me. Should we look at the song yeah, sparrow? We, okay. We skip that one. We like um, sparrows. Okay, we're playing it. We're <laughs> going to play this song three times. Listen to it again. See those three notes at the beginning? Mm -hmm. A little buzzy. You see those five notes at the end. Just feel this whole song one more time. Three buzzy notes, the big buzzy. Five. Now feel what comes next. Do you hear how different that song is? Yeah. Strikingly different. And, and if we could go to the next slide, you'll see what that song actually looks like. It's very different from the first one. And lots of people love to listen to song sparrows and say, oh, there's a song sparrow. And what I would say, oh, there's a song sparrow. Let's wait. Let's listen. Because he'll sing one of his songs maybe 10, 20 times. And then if you're really listening, it'll hit you like a truck. You'll hear him switch to another song. And he has about eight different songs. And, and the great joy, and this is what I did when I started out on that William Finley Refuge mm -hmm. many years ago. I learned to recognize all the songs of Buick's wrens. So 16 different songs. For a song sparrow, eight different songs is a piece of cake. So we could look at the next slide, and you see two more of his songs. And the next slide again. And the next slide. There are seventh and eighth songs. We look at the next slide, we see all eight of them together. Wow. This, is, this is the mind of the singing song sparrow that I was recording. Uh, is actually in Virginia a couple of years ago. But you look at each one of those songs and they are so different from each other. Uh, and, you know, what I love to do with audiences, which I'll do tonight, is I'll play all eight of these songs and then, as a professor, of course, you never forget how to give a quiz. <laughs> then I pick one of them at random and I play that one at random and everybody can pick out which one it is because their eyes are so good at seeing patterns and hearing patterns. And, and then you go out and listen to a song sparrow and it's, it's inevitable. You stop and you slow down and you say, let's listen for this, what this song sparrow is doing. How many songs is he going to sing of one of those before he switches to another? I can hear that. And, and then it's amazing what you start to hear. Yeah, that's, that's great. Is the song C or H? <laughs> yeah, and you start to letter them and you get to know them as individuals and you realize, oh, the neighboring song sparrow has different songs and oh, let me listen to how they converse with each other. That's very interesting. Let me ask you a question. Let me just remind folks, please do call in if you have a question. We'll run the phone number and, and other ways to contact us, email. Um, but if you have any questions about this fascinating subject, please do feel free to call in because 
Um, I'm sure Don would like to hear a diversity of questions, but seeing the eight songs of the uh, Sparrow, is that a, a normal number of songs for a bird to have in a repertoire, or at the low end or high end? What? Eight is perhaps medium. A lot of birds, like the yellow throat we showed earlier, a chipping sparrow, a white-throated sparrow, a lot of them have just one. Mm -hmm. uh, song sparrow, eight. Eastern marsh wren, maybe 50 different songs. Western marsh wren, three times as many as that. Oh, and you go up to a mockingbird, maybe with 200, a brown thrasher with a couple of thousand, wow. up to 2,000 songs all stored up there in his brain in those, those song control centers. So there's an enormous uh, diversity of the ways in which birds sing and, and quite a range of these song repertoires too. Do we have any uh, knowledge about why a bird would want more than one song? Well, one for a lot of warblers, there's a there's a, a simpler answer than for the, all the other birds. The, <laughs> uh, these warblers, like a chestnut-sided warbler, for example, one of my favorites on the front of my book, uh, has different songs in different categories. It really has two categories of songs, and one it uses largely to address females, mm -hmm. and the other songs or group of songs seem to be used largely to address males. So there are different functions for these two groups of songs. For some of these other birds, you know, why would a brown thrasher have 2,000? Why, why does a song, song sparrow have eight or eight to 10? Some would say, well, they're used to impress females. The more songs the male has, the, the more likely it is he can impress a female. But I, don't, I think that's a gross oversimplification. Uh, take Western marsh wrens, for example. I think it's Something so you've instructive. Very much. Oh, I love Western marsh wrens. Finley Refuge. Uh, <laughs> my friend uh, Jerry Verner studied them on Turnbull Refuge in eastern Washington. Uh, and uh, so, a hundred, let's say, Jerry Verner's had over a hundred songs apiece. And if you listen to what one bird is doing and then train your ear to listen to what the other birds in the area are doing, you find that they are matching each other. They're pulling song number 50 out of, one of them singing song number 50. And the other one, because we've studied how they interact with each yeah. other, we know that what's going through the mind of that neighbor is, Oh, he sang 50. Well, you know, I could sing number 50 and match him. I could also sing number 51 because I could jump ahead of him in our common sequence that we all know. Or he could say to his neighbor, more or less, I'm going to ignore you altogether. I'm going to go someplace else in our grand sequence, and I'll sing number 79. And, and, that, and that may just be a, a nice status quo statement to the neighbors. You know, all is well. I'm not... I'm not addressing you in particular, but I'm here. So they have all these yeah. songs, and they have this really complex way of conversing with each other, but don't ask me why. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> but we don't know if it's territoriality or cooperation or any of that, really. We, we, we know they're interacting. We know they're interacting. I think there's a dominance kind of hierarchy going on among males. I think if we knew the ages of the birds, we'd see the older birds doing something very different from the younger birds. And I think in all of these interactions, the females are listening to how the males are interacting. And they're making mating decisions based on, on what these males are saying to each other. Because they're, they're polygynous. Each male does not have just one female, but, right. but he may have what has been loosely called a harem of females in his territory. and. Uh, even if a female is not within a male's territory, she still might travel over to that male and collect a few sperm to raise offspring by that male. So it's, there are a lot of decisions females are making, I'm convinced, as they listen to these males uh, argue with each other. It's very interesting. Well, we've been talking about the western marsh wren. and the, uh, Why don't we put up the slide on that? We have that ready to go. Okay. Let's, There's the two marsh wrens. Yeah, western, the two. Eastern. Yeah, and the way... They look the same. <laughs> well, Mark, point. you're right. And the way people have studied, and all our field guides and most of our systematics is based on some people going out with a shotgun, blasting these birds off their perches and laying them on their backs in a museum tray and, and looking at them and saying, are they the same or different? And, <laughs> and what they'd conclude is, well, they look the same to me, therefore they must be one species. But when you crawl inside the minds of these creatures and really listen to them, mm -hmm. it's embarrassing what we've missed. So we could go to the next slide. 
and we can look at, and we'll just look at this one. On the left are two of this bird's 50 different songs, and on the right, I've taken a couple of those little repeated units toward the end of the song and expanded them about 10 times so we can see the delightful little details. And so in each of those two on the right, I've circled the lower notes, dainty little notes. And if you know something about the structure of sound and harmonics and all, you'll notice that everything up above those three notes is simply harmonics of those fundamental notes down low. So we're not going to listen to this, but if you did listen, you'd hear these dainty little notes of these eastern birds. But when you look over on the left, you're seeing the songs, I think, much as we hear them. Very hurried, our ears are very poor at seeing the details. Mm -hmm. But now that we've seen the details of what these marshrens themselves, I'm convinced, can hear, let's look at the next slide and look what a western marsh wren does. Wow. Yeah, you say, wow. Uh, look at those little, the, the dainty, the, the full song at, some, at normal speed, the way we would hear it is on the left. And then again, I've taken those little repeated units out and expanded them about 10 times. Look at that. If you had these sonograms laid down side by side in a museum tray and said, does the same bird produce this sound as produce those dainty little harmonic notes? And that you'd say, absolutely not. And, uh, this, this is just a harsh, angry sound. It's the, you know, it's like a woodpecker ripping up a tree. <laughs> and the next slide shows you some of my favorite places uh, in Nebraska. There's, uh, oh, Valentine, Lake Andes, these good refuges. There is the line drawn through the corn wow. where to the east, all the way to the Atlantic, you hear this eastern bird. And to the west, all the way to the Pacific, you hear the western bird. And we could listen. Should we listen to this? Yeah. Well, let me let me explain it. it before we play this. What I do here is I, I take those songs of the eastern birds and I slow them down. I think it's six times, so we hear those dainty little notes. Just the end part of the song. We're not going to play the whole song, but just those, that end part that's so telling. And then just imagine yourself doing this transect all the way from the Atlantic, and at some point you hit this line in Nebraska where it switches over to the western. And now we're going to be listening to the western then, and you will hear these harsh, angry sounds of the western bird slowed down. So, Mark, I'm not going to tell you when we cross that line, but <laughs> I'll hear. you tell me when, all right, let's go ahead and play it. There's a good eastern. You hear those dainty little notes? Sounds like the Wonder. western. No, <laughs> oh, Easter. Easter. Little notes. More little notes. Still little notes. I'll help you out. Yeah, you got me. Listen to just beautiful Eastern. That sounds different. There we are. <laughs> That's different. Hear how different the harsh wow, sounds. It's worse, like he's got a cold. Yes. <laughs> It sounds like they're laughing at us, yeah. You'd never hear eastern birds doing it. Just really harsh. And so we look at our field guides and we have one species. And these wrens, you know, if they could laugh out loud, they would. <laughs> they're <laughs> laughing at our field guides. Is there any physical barrier there? It seems like a bizarre um, break between the eastern and western songs there. And, and when I looked at your map, I didn't see a, a topographical no, or a water barrier or anything. I think there are some subtle vegetational differences and rainfall differences. And But you can go up to Saskatchewan across the Capel River Valley, mm -hmm. and it's just a gradient of eastern to western uh, birds. And they, they occur together in the same marshes uh, with uh, Mike Braun at the Smithsonian. We've done some genetic work, and clearly they're different genetically. Everything these wrens are saying, genetically, vocally, uh, we're two species, uh, <laughs> get it right. <laughs> well, it raises an interesting question because um, I don't recall from my studies, but do we ever use um, calls for systematic classification uh, of birds? Good point, Field Mark. guides sometimes do yes. as an indicator. But Good point. Because these birds learn their songs, it can be confusing. 
because you know they can learn these wrens can learn the songs of the other species but you're right the calls don't lie so you look at the calls because they're based right on the genetic material somehow a lot of these calls are embedded and coded in the genetic uh, material so yeah you listen to the calls of the eastern and western and they're very different mm -hmm. and I it's, it's the same for the winter wren you check the field guides they're one species but the songs are extraordinarily different uh, we could go there if we wanted we could <laughs> let's hold that hold, hold back on that but the calls too are so different mm -hmm. uh, so some at some unknown point uh, maybe northern Canada someplace there is this transition that that we don't we don't know where it is but there's a transition from east to west and and uh, they're just strikingly different in North America as different as any two species could possibly be one of the things that came out in your book is um, how many new discoveries are being made about the the purpose of bird songs uh, how they differentiate over geographic mm -hmm. areas or within species um, is this a newer science is there still a lot of work to be done or did is this a a culmination in your book so it just seems fresh because so many of us knew so little about oh. it I, mean, what? I think your last point so many of us knew so little and so many of us know so little with almost any bird and this is I, I hope one of the take-home messages of this book and and the hermit thrush chapter for example mm -hmm. I make a point of saying you know what this jaw-dropping stuff that I learned about this one hermit thrush in a half day's time anybody could do because the and the techniques I lay out in an appendix like it really is simple you park your car in a garage and don't go away for that weekend trip and you saved enough gas money to to buy some little equipment and 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 buy a little $25 program from Cornell University Raven Light that lets right. you see these songs from any CD that you own so no this anybody who has a curious mind can go out and have fun and and hear things and discover things that that nobody knew why don't we go to the hermit thrush okay uh, slide and you can tell us what you uh, what you learned about the hermit okay thrush. that let's go to slide number 20 and I love this quote by F. Schuyler Matthews. Uh, the grand climax of all bird music, our gifted thrush sings of the glory of life, of the joy of heaven. You know, as an academic, before I retired, I couldn't have done this uh, because, <laughs> because we're supposed to be cold and objective. But when you hear a hermit thrush songs, it is extraordinary. John Burroughs has a wonderful quote where he's listening to hermit thrushes and it's actually the second paragraph in the in the hermit thrush chapter where he essentially says you know I climbed up the mountain and in this in the stillness of the evening I listened to hermit thrushes and you can have all the religion in the world you can enjoy all the music in the world and all the finest human literature but nothing compares to listening to a hermit thrush song <laughs> he said it far more poetically than I did of course but <laughs> But nobody had really studied hermit. We all knew they're so beautiful, but but nobody really seemed to want to explore and try to understand them. And what I found in this one hermit thrush just absolutely blew me away. We could look at that next slide. Uh, let's see, that would be 21. And that shows just two of his songs. And that's just black on white. It doesn't look very elegant. But there are two songs that are up there quite high. See that number four? That's 4,000 cycles per second. That's about the highest note on the piano. So this is, this is getting up there. It's getting hard for some of us to hear. So two similar songs in the same pitch. Then we go to the next slide, and we say, oh, what is this? We have two more on another similar pitch. And let's go to the next slide. Hey, is Kreutzmann just trying to trick us here by putting similar <laughs> slides, or is, the, is he going to lead up to something that the hermit thrush really does and knows? One more slide. And now one more. And, oh, sometimes I love to just go back up and down with those slides, that whole sequence, because you get a feeling for what this hermit thrush could do. Let's look at the next slide. Now you see all nine slides. And the two very highest ones are at the top, the two lowest ones at the bottom, and the ones in between. Uh, and he has an odd number, so there's one blank hole there. 
And so if you could ask, if you were going to sing, Mark, if you were the most exquisite human vocalist or bird vocalist and wanted to sing the most exquisite series of songs based on these nine, you, what would you do? Like a song sparrow, you could take one and sing it many times before switching to another. Ah, that's not very special. <laughs> or you could go down the scale, then up the scale. Or you could sing the next song at random so that you'd never know what's coming next. But he does something even more exquisite than that. What he does is he sings so that the next song is especially different from the one he just sang. And to do that, he needs to know his songs backwards and forwards. He has to know the degree of similarity of these songs. So when he sings song A there in the upper left, never would he sing A again. Never would he go across and sing F because it's just too similar. Right. Never in the sequence I've studied did he actually go to either D or H. But instead of taking these small steps, he takes these giant leaps. He might go from A all the way down to B, and then all the way down to C. And from C, he might go all the way up to F. So he takes, he really knows what he's doing. And a lot of people then ask, well, what's he thinking? <laughs> and, <laughs> and to me, that's... That is, of course, the logical question to ask, what's he thinking? But the real question, I think, the hidden question that we should be asking is, what's she thinking? <laughs> She's not singing, but she dictates what songs he sings. Because for we, we're hearing, I like to think of it, we're hearing all the success stories. Every male songbird that we hear singing is here singing with us because his mother listened to his father and said, He's singing the right stuff. So every bird that we hear singing can trace his singing roots back to the beginning of time in an unbroken string of success stories. A bird gets the wrong right. song, why, well, he's out of the gene pool. <laughs> she rejects him. So end of the line. So we are hearing all these success stories. And, and the females, by who they choose to mate with, are really dictating the songs of the males, which song genes are passed on, which song singing abilities are passed on to the next generation. So every songbird we hear, we, we should be thanking a female. <laughs> no wonder they sound so good. Well, it's certainly <laughs> versatility. I mean, it's striking, the, the repertoire you showed. And I, that, that is the beauty of the book and the sonograms. I mean, you say early on, you know, your, your eyes are as important as your ears or... You know, you're actually viewing these songs. It's mm -hmm. not something we normally think of. No, and our eyes are so good. We develop our eyes in ways that we would never think of developing our ears unless, heaven forbid, we come blind. Mm -hmm. But you talk to blind people and you ask them about their ears and what they hear. We all have that potential to really improve our hearing. And I would like to think this, by looking at these sonograms, it, it, it's a small step towards really engaging our eyes and then even more so engaging our ears and let the two of them work together to, to really hear what's going on around us. Well, let's move to another part of your book that was fascinating, perhaps the most fascinating to me, and that was um, how birds learn their songs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you've got some slides on, on babbling that may actually help us with this or not. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, you know, we could say a thousand times that birds learn to sing like we learn to speak. And they, they have to hear themselves. It's mm -hmm. this feedback. Whenever we speak or we hear a word, we hear a new word, Mark, and, and we instantly memorize what that word sounds like. And then we say it, we listen to ourselves say it, and we say, oh, that sounds right or it doesn't sound right. Let me try it again. So it's that hearing and memorizing that right. is so critical to us. And it's the same for these birds. And oh, this takes me back to the Finley Refuge. Uh, okay. Has to be my favorite refuge because that's where I <laughs> that's where I grew up uh, scientifically. That's the first chapter in my research life with Dick Rogers as manager and a wonderful series of biologists, uh, Fred Zeilemacher and uh, good friends. But here it was, uh, late '60s and. Friends of mine had actually said, we know so much about birds that I don't think I can learn anything more. I'm going to go study something else. And I said, 
Here was a very simple question that I wanted to answer, and it was, from whom does a baby bird learn its songs? Yeah. Buick's friends on the Finley Refuge were the perfect place to work with these, uh, because they're resident, and I figured, resident birds, if I ban these babies, they won't travel much more than a mile, maybe two miles, and with a lot of searching, I'll find these babies. Right. So it was really fun, it's immensely satisfying getting to know a whole population of birds, like you know, mothers, fathers, uh, offspring, grandparents, cousins. You, you see this whole social network. Uh, the, sh the short story is that the, the young male did learn from his father, but when he left home, he rejected all of dad's songs and learned the songs of other birds out there. But let's look at that babbling. So yeah. if, we, if we look at slide number 34, we'll see uh, the beautiful, sharp, crisp, clear songs of adults. Uh, these, this adult Buick's Wren, uh, these are Finley Refuge songs. I can hear them, see them, I can <laughs> smell Finley Refuge. Uh, I can almost taste the blackberries in season, too. Uh, so an adult, a Buick strand would sing one song like we see on the top many times over and then he'd switch to another one like we see at the bottom. But just to save time here, if we click on that little speaker, we'll hear the top song and then the bottom song, but just hear the sharp, crisp details and see those details. So this bird knows exactly what it's doing and this is what a young bird must master. So in the next slide, we see a young bird's attempt at mastering this. And these are just the first four seconds in a two slide sequence that show how messy this young bird's attempts are. And what he's doing is taking everything that he knows and just singing it, babbling it out of sequence. It's this nonsensical sequence. Nothing is sharp and crisp, but it's all up there in his head and he's just working it over. So let's, let's listen to this. And then go right to the next slide and we see the continuation of this eight second and go ahead and play this. So instead of taking one song and singing it sharply and crisply many times over, he's just blurting everything out. <laughs> and in the next slide we see a comparison between what the adult does, that sharp, crisp song, and just a brief segment of what the baby is doing. And you look at segments A and B, see how sharp and crisp and repeatable A and B are in the adult. Then you look at the bottom. B, why well, he's got two of them there, but they're pretty messy. A, why well, he's not being consistent <laughs> at all. But then look, he's just reversed the sequence. And uh, so it's just all playing out. Then the next slide shows the, com the emphasis that I really want to drive home. What each of us as humans did is exactly the same what these young songbirds are going through, like this young robin on the left. So the next slide shows my daughter when she's 18 <laughs> months old, and she's not actually babbling here, but, but uh, this is her age, and she's now a physician, of course, and speaks two languages. And She must be thrilled to have you showing this slide. She's thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, uh, I should say, simply older than 29. <laughs> but the next slide shows what we saw that young Wren doing. My daughter is sitting there in a high chair with nobody around, with no dog or no cat, and you look at these sounds that she has memorized up in her brain, and, and just like I said about the wren, she is, she's taking each of these sounds that she's memorized, she's playing them out and practicing them, and there's no dog in the room, there's no kitty in the room, daddy's <laughs> not in the room, he's around the corner holding a microphone. <laughs> And you see the second line, wee, 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 that's, she's just recalling the, the story of the little piggy. So we could play this, and, and as you hear what my daughter is doing, realize that each of us did this, every songbird, every songbird is, does this. It's my favorite part, of course. <laughs> and 
every That's songbird. very clever. <laughs> every human. And it really, I got a 19 month old. I recognize that language intimately. <laughs> yes. And it really is extraordinary that in uh, several different lineages have developed this ability to learn their adult communication system just as we have. And so in that sense, songbirds are more like us than are our closest living relatives. All the, the apes, none of them have this kind of learned communication system. Now the songbirds must pick this up a little more quickly. They probably don't babble as long as we do because they have a shorter life. Shorter life span. When is their babbling stage? Or does oh, it vary the, from species to it species? It varies from species to species. You can start to detect little musings and throat movements when they're about three weeks old. Mm -hmm. The young wren we heard was recorded in August on the Finley Refuge, and he was hatched uh, maybe two to three months earlier. So August of the year, normally we think of August as being dead, quiet. The adults are done singing for the year. But if you go out with a practiced ear and start listening for these little musings in the underbrush, it is absolutely extraordinary what you start to hear. Oh, wow. I did this just this past year. I said, August, I'm usually on vacation, but I'm going to go out listening. It was unbelievable what I heard in a little stretch of a bicycle trail near us in Amherst. There were, oh, multiple titmice and chickadees and Carolina wrens and house wrens and warbling vireos and red-eyed vireos and, and I don't know how many other species. All these young birds were practicing. Wonderful to listen to. Well, that's great. I think we may have a question. <laughs> this just in off the press. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions. Actually. Really begin with this. Um, what new research do you think should be done based on your work, based on your bird song work? Oh. Are there other projects out there that are just dying to be done? I think a lot is just dying to be done. What I encourage people to do is just exercise their own curiosity. And anybody can have fun. And it doesn't make any difference whether somebody else already knew this. It's the spirit of discovery. But for me, some of the most exciting stuff is, why does a wood thrush, or why does that hermit thrush sing the way he does? Mm -hmm. What is it that females are listening to? I think this is one of, the, one of the most interesting and perhaps answerable questions. What is she listening to? When a female is paired with a male and she makes her mating decisions, perhaps not all of her young are gonna be fathered by her partner, but she may go and collect sperm from other males in the neighborhood on what is she basing her decisions? And I think we can, we can study with DNA fingerprinting the paternity wars and, and try to crawl inside the mind of the female to let us appreciate better why, why we love these wood thrush songs <laughs> and hermit thrush songs. So to me, that's one of the biggest... So there hasn't been as much research done on the, the recipient's end, on the female end. No, no. I, I think we've been obsessed with males and yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are thinking about females but it's so tough right. I mean, it's tough enough to understand what members of our own species are thinking <laughs> especially the opposite sex perhaps <laughs> you know. it's been a research challenge of mine for 10 years <laughs> <laughs> so and now we're talking about a foreign species and yeah. trying to grasp what it is and but we're making some headway there and i think we'll see some answers in the next five ten years well i have another question from, good from the field um Somebody emailed in this question, what advice do you have for those of us on Christmas bird counts who collect bird data based on bird songs? Who, uh, boy, identifying by sounds, it's just so critical there, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what advice? Well, I guess the Buy main... Buy your book and CD. <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug it. Well, <laughs> but it's funny. Uh, because what I really try to stress in my book is not so helpful to the person who's doing this breeding bird survey where identifying by sound is so important. Right. What I try to do is take people, I try to actually do an end around this identification mm -hmm. because, it, oh, for me, the immense, the, the, there's this immense joy and satisfaction in identifying with these creatures before, even before you identify. So many people that are just starting out can't tell a robin from a rose-breasted grosbeak from a red-eyed vireo. And I say, well, you know, let's wait a minute. Let's, 
let's just sit down with this robin and, and just hear the beauty of what he's doing. And you crawl inside this robin's skin. And before you know it, you value robin so much that you can't imagine misidentifying a robin for anything else. So, sure. so what I try to get people to do is, is not be too obsessed about identifying, but more identify with. And before you know it, identifying becomes second nature. It's, uh, I think we've been going about it in the wrong way. We <laughs> obsess about identifying first before you get to know the creatures. And, but for the Christmas bird count, well, absolutely, you, you, had, you need to be able to identify. Sure. Um, and not enough of them are singing at that time of the year. You've got to know these little call notes and the little chirps and twitters. And are there good CDs on bird calls? Oh, there are. Uh, but again, it's mostly songs that are on yeah. the CDs, all the little calls. There are some good, um, oh, more and more good CDs are coming out. Like, there's an owl CD coming out of Cornell, for example, that has all the little nuances of owl sounds and uh -huh things you hear in the night. So more and more of, of these CD products are saying, well, let's move beyond just a couple of songs for identifying it, really grasp what they're doing. Okay. And the third question we had come in is, have you ever met a tone-deaf singing bird? <laughs> <laughs> that one's a little from oh. the field. I have met birds who have learned the wrong songs. Learning is risky business. <laughs> right. Uh, I found a couple of Buick's wrens, or a couple of house wrens who were singing Buick's wren songs. Mm -hmm. And we find, a lot of people find these if you really know what to listen for. And these birds are singing all season long because they are unpaired. The females have rejected them. So these are some of the mistakes that uh, are weeded out of the population. Does that mean they just had the, the other species of bird near them when they were used and, and heard? We don't know. We don't know. Um, it's possible that, you know, I can imagine a scenario where a young bird is hatched late in the season after adults have, have uh, s uh, stopped singing. They've stopped singing for the year. So there's no model during this time of the year when the birds are really keen on learning. And I would, a little corollary to that question, I would say that I have never met a tone-deaf human either. <laughs> a lot of people say, I'm tone-deaf. I would never be able to, to lit, but I would say, well, I'll curb my tongue just a little. <laughs> so, you haven't listened. Let me sit down with you with a robin. Let's go to the robin chapter here, and let's listen on the CD and look at those sonograms and take your eyes and tune them in with your ears. And I don't think there's such a person as a tone-deaf person. There are people who have not gone about it, I think, in the easiest way to get into truly listening. Mm -hmm. And they might think they're tone-deaf, but... I have never met a tone-deaf person. Well, that's a good segue to uh, the next bird I'd like to look at, which would be the, the wood thrush. The it's wood got thrush. a fairly oh. sophisticated sonogram, and uh, hopefully you can help us. We yes. have the slide of that up, and then we're going we're gonna to pull this song off the, uh, the CD that's in your book. Yes, let's go ahead and just play it. play this song and what we'll hear, we'll hear the rich notes at the beginning of this song. Oops, I need to back up. What we have here, oh and Mark here, I have a bit of a disconnect in my brain because I don't think I can match this song with what's on the CD because <laughs> okay. uh, there's a tiny bit of homework that I didn't do to match <laughs> things up here. So, uh, but let's look at that again. All right. Let's look at it again because... Uh, That's quite a sonogram. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at the left side and we see these rich whistled notes. And if we slowed those down, uh, we can play this on the... Uh, let's click on that little speaker and we'll hear it. Excellent. So we heard that. Uh, now let's go to the next slide. Let's look at this again. And you see on the left again that rich, that low whistle in those cascading series, those three notes. And then on the right hand is this ending. So let's play this one more time. Now most of us hear the beginning as a nice rich whistle, rich series of whistles. A little too fast for us, but about the right side of the song, it just happens so fast that it's just a blur to our ears. 
But the right side is where the really exquisite music occurs. Let's take a look at that. Rent West slide. Here's that last part of the song really expanded. And then what we see here are the two voices that this wood thrush is using. Unlike us, we have this single voice box at the top of our trachea, our windpipe. If we follow our trachea down, we come to two bronchi that go to our lungs. And at the top of each bronchus, the bird has a voice box. So they have these two voice boxes that they can sing simultaneously. And it is just priceless. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able... Let's go ahead and click on that. And if we could hear that, we're not going to hear that left track, which is that whistle in that lower part of the song. There's the middle part of the song that we're hearing, and now we're going to hear left and right together. So that is a little frustrating. Let me, I think I can, let's go to slide 54, if we could, please. Let's try this, and I think, yes, okay, this, this does it very well, I think. Uh, and we're not going to play this song from the, from the screen, but we're going to go to that CD, and that is going to be track 70 on the CD. But let's look at it for just a minute. So everything that you see down below there is done by the left track, and those whistles there up above the 8,000 hertz line, mm -hmm. Those are all the right tracks. So with this song, this is the ending of the song I really want to emphasize. You can really see how, what the different contributions are from the left and the right track. So let's play the first 20 seconds of track 70. And we will then hear the left voice box sweeping up. A little buzzy note and then sweeping up. There it is. That's the left. We're still having problems here. Uh, my apologies. We're not. We're still not getting the, the, the left track. So we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, well, happily, the birds never have. The birds. <laughs> if the birds had a technical difficulty, they would be weeded out. And, and I guess, Mark, this is where you're going to give a plug for the book. It's on track 70. And <laughs> it's on track 70. It sounds perfect on my car stereo. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're running uh, out of time, Don, but first of all, I have to say your, uh, your infectious enthusiasm <laughs> for bird song is, is, is wonderful. It's, I mean, it's all a... around us. We hear it every day, and especially at this time of the year. And, and I just cry out for people to slow down a little and listen. And, and people's idea of a big day when they're birding is to go out and list as many as they can, using the song as identifying. And I, I hurt from the inside. I just want to say... Stop and listen to that one bird for an hour or two. Or, and uh, it's amazing where those kind of little exercises can lead. Well, this has been a really fun and very quick hour. Thank you so much, Don. Good I really fun. really appreciate it. It was wonderful. My pleasure, Mark. And I'd like to thank those of you who took the time to tune in this afternoon. Thanks again for giving us an hour to learn a heck of a lot about bird songs and, and perhaps pursue it more in the book. And I'd just like to let folks know that our next conservationist in action uh, distance learning broadcast will be next Thursday, May 11th, May 11th, uh, from 12:30 to 1:30, a slightly different time. Uh, but next Thursday, May 11th, from 12:30 to 1:30, uh, we're going to have a filmmaker out here, Andy Royer, who's going to show us a film called Trout Grass, looking at bamboo and its journey from China to the U.S. and then how it's used by fishermen on both continents. Thank you very much.